Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to be sharing an amazing Metropolitan Masterpiece with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episode starts, all sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find a link in the episode description, as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history and at metropolitan.masterpieces. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. The next piece on the Metropolitan Masterpiece list is a relatively new acquisition for the museum. Duccio's Madonna and Child, dated circa 1300 CE, was a must-have for the Met's collection for two reasons. Firstly, is its rarity. Works of this age and caliber hardly ever come onto the market. Secondly, Duccio's work represents the beginning of the massive transition from the medieval and Byzantine style to the rebirth of the Renaissance. We'll cover both of these topics in this episode, so keep on listening to learn more. Upon first glance, Duccio's Madonna and Child is rather unassuming. There's no background or indication of where the tender scene is taking place. Instead, that space is filled with a rich golden shine. Most of the work is filled with the body of the Madonna. She wears a rich blue robe that has gold details to match the background. She looks tenderly down at her son as he reaches up towards her. Baby Jesus is quite a bit smaller than his mother, but doesn't seem to have the same proportions as an infant. Instead, he looks more like a miniature man. Despite this, we can see how much the pair love each other. The other emotion in this work is the hint of sadness. If the viewer looks at Mary's face, there is a slight downward turn of her eyes and lips. One can almost sense the tightness of her features. These details were added to alert the viewer that the Madonna knows of her son's eventual fate upon the cross. This piece is quite small, measuring at only 27.9 cm by 21 cm or 11 by 8.3 inches. Compared to Duccio's older pieces that he is most famous for, it's positively minuscule. This indicates to art historians that it was likely commissioned as a private devotional piece. No matter its size, Duccio's Madonna and Child is a truly remarkable work of art. There is no doubt that this work has a strong medieval and Byzantine style. This is hardly surprising, as Duccio lived and worked during the Trecento, or 1300s, period of Italian art history. First is the golden background. This is quite common during this era. One of the reasons is because gold was associated with the infant Christ because he was presented with it as a gift at the nativity. Additionally, descriptions of heaven in the Bible mention that it is covered in gold and precious jewels. To achieve this effect, Duccio would have had to painstakingly apply small pieces of gold leaf to the wooden panel with water. This technique was called water gilding. Next, he would have had to polish the gold to ensure that there were no seams between the pieces of gold leaf and to ensure that it shone brilliantly. By fixing a gold leaf background, Duccio was telling the audience that this scene took place not in our world, but in heaven. Some historians believe that Duccio made a trip to Constantinople during his life and picked up a few techniques during his visit. Regardless of the veracity of this claim, we can see one major element of the Byzantine style in this work. Duccio's use of color leans heavily towards the jewel tone end of the spectrum. The blues and oranges of the figure's robes are deep and rich. Even without a natural light source, they create their own shadows and visual interest for the viewers. However, despite these elements, we can see Duccio moving towards a stylistic revolution. This is not surprising, especially because the artist is credited with creating the Trecento and Sienese schools of art. One of the major changes from the past styles is evident in the piece is the softening of lines, especially on the bodies of the Madonna and Christ Child. In other works from the period, figures tend to be blocky with sharper angles in the shoulders and face in particular. But here in Duccio's work, the shoulders and planes of the face have rounded edges. Not only does this impart more humanity into the piece, but it adds an element of naturalism to the divine persons by creating a slight sense of three-dimensionality. Another change we see in this work by Duccio is the interaction between the Madonna and baby Jesus. In previous eras, they were stoic, holy figures. Their presence is meant to aid in contemplation of the divine. However, Duccio has transformed them into a mother and child. Yes, the viewer knows who they are because of their garments and golden background, but the tenderness between the pair is unprecedented. Mary's emotion as she looks down at her son and Christ reaching out to play with her veil as Enli Toller would. It is a scene that any parent would recognize. By giving the divine a human element, Duccio was removing barriers for worship. Next, I'm going to discuss the artist and how the piece came to be at the Met. But first, let's take a quick break. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take conversations with your fans to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. 
And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've been using them like crazy. I upload every week with Accessible Art History, the podcast, and I'm so thankful to have a program that's easy for me to use, especially because I'm not super tech savvy. I highly recommend you give it a try. So download Spotify for Podcasters or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hey there, my name is Annalisa and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. As a part of my content offerings, I produce a podcast. For the first several seasons, I will be discussing 50 objects that shape the history of Western art. From prehistoric cave paintings to contemporary art, I'll be covering it all. The podcast was designed for everyone, from the casual couch historian to a museum's expert. It all fits within the larger mission of accessible art history, to create a space for art history lovers, students, and anyone who is curious to explore all periods of art history and human creation. New episodes drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. Make sure to follow the Instagram page for all updates at accessible.art.history. All right, now that we're back, let's talk all about Duccio. His full name was Duccio de Buenasegna, and he was born around 1255 to 1260 in Siena, Italy. Due to spotty records at the time, there is little we know about his family and personal life. A few surviving archival records tell us that he ran up quite a large debt and was possibly married with seven children. There's also an indication that he traveled to Rome, Paris, Assisi, and Constantinople. Duccio worked as an artist from around 1278 to 1311. Despite this long and certainly lucrative career, we only have about 13 remaining paintings. The two most famous are the Ruchelai Madonna and the Maesta for the high altar of the Siena Cathedral. Both images can be seen on the accompanying blog post for this episode. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, Duccio is credited with founding both the Trecento and Sienese school of painting. They are characterized by rich golden and jewel tones found in Byzantine art and the newly found sense of humanity utilized in the early days of the Renaissance. Duccio's work influenced many artists in and around Siena, most famously Simone Martini and the brothers Ambrogio and Pietro Lorenzetti. Duccio died around 1318-19, aged 57-64. Despite the lack of historical records and a few surviving paintings, it's clear that he had a huge impact on the history of art. So how did this rare masterpiece come to be in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art? To figure it out, we have to go back in time a bit. We don't have any records of this work until the mid-19th century. However, this isn't uncommon for works from the medieval period. The first known owner of this painting is the Russian Count Grigory Stroganov. He claimed he bought it from a dealer who had the painting labeled as by an unknown artist. He lent it to the Palazzo Publico of Siena and he also kept it at his palazzo in Rome. Art historian Mary Logan Berenson researched the piece after the exhibit in Siena and believed it to be Duccio of the highest order. She died only a few years later in 1910, but her legacy remained. A Belgium engineer and art collector, Adolf Stoklit, purchased it and added it to his personal collection. He was intelligent and understood the importance of maintaining a world-class collection. Stoklit was careful to keep his works in controlled environments. He lent the work, which had taken its, his name as a Stoklit Madonna, to two exhibitions in the 1930s and only allowed visitors to and only allowed visitors to view it on rare occasions. Stokelyk died in 1949 and left his entire collection to his wife and children. They closely guarded it and only allowed photographs and scholars to visit every once in a while. However, in the early 2000s, the family decided to sell off a few pieces. One of them was Duccio's Madonna. In 2004, the work was shopped around between major museums around the world. The family was asking an astounding $45 million for it. The Getty in Los Angeles thought the price was too high, but the Louvre and the Met were interested. With only 13 known Duccios in the world, neither museum had one in their collection. As you may have guessed, the Met won the bidding war, and Duccio entered the collection. This was the highest price the museum had ever paid for a work of art. For reference, in 2023 dollars, it's equivalent to $71,268,660.67. Today, Duccio's Madonna and Child is a prized part of the Met's European painting collection. With only 13 surviving paintings, Duccio's works are rare treasures. They represent the radical transition between medieval and renaissance periods. This is why I've classified his Madonna as a metropolitan masterpiece. And make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the smiling figures or the remojadas of the Met.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history and at metropolitan.masterpieces for updates and to keep an eye out for the next episode. They drop every week on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, you can find episodes there on Well, about two weeks after each episode is posted. Cheers and see you for the next episode.